Good evening, good people. How about we talk about Stellenbosch FC? Let's go. That's how it goes. They keep asking about the best when they know it's me. Okay. Asking about the rest when they know it's me. Straight in, I guess. You know it's me. I started the show by saying let's talk about Stellenbosch FC. And I can tell you right now, they deserve to be talked about. They do. I put out a tweet over the weekend and I did some more digging. Over 20 games unbeaten from Stellenbosch FC. Culling Cup in the bag. The Culling knockout that they played in the bag already. They second placed on the log. Semi-finals of the Netman Cup, they're there. And something that they're getting right is that their young players are flourishing. And I got to give Steve Barker some credit because every single year he loses key players. Gunika has gone to Chiefs. You can see what he's doing over there. Not much. Dupree as well. Mendieta as well. Ntet was gone, losing key players every single transfer window. But for some reason, this team stays competing, stays getting stronger, and it seems like they're building something. And I was happy for him. I was happy for, for Steve Buck. I tweeted. I was like, okay, great. Do your thing. But then I sat. Then I sat and I thought, I was just thinking, I was like, okay, shut but that's Stellan boss, though. We're not, like, it's not like... They're sort of the powerhouses. Yes, people can talk about their owners, but I'm talking about in a football sense, they're not the powerhouses, and it seems like they're second and behind. Chiefs and Pirates, guys, what's your excuse? Like, what is the excuse of Amakosi and the Buccaneers? Why can't they do what Stellenbosch is doing? And considering the fact that these two clubs take players from Stellenbosch FC and take players from other clubs, but somehow they don't seem to compete you know, Orlando Pirates, I'll be lenient with you because, Sharp, you've got the trophies, the cups in the bag. But, like, in the league, where are you guys in the league? Because we just saw a fairy tale story over the weekend by Leverkusen, you know, doing their thing. Lille did their thing in League Earn. Liverpool did their thing a couple of years ago in England. But you two boys cannot do it. Simply cannot do it. And what it shows is that you boys like some planning, some long term planning. It's just not there. And to be fair, your fans allow it. Fans do not demand consistency from these two teams. You celebrate them in moments. They win once or at a derby and they can celebrate for three months. And draw. And lose. But that's what you guys have done to these old clubs. I'll tell you something. Right? I'm glad that Stellenbosch is doing this because when Sunnaunt is doing it, it's like, it, it, it's money. It's because they have money. But now what's the excuse if Stellenbosch does it? My best advice to you both, stop living off your past glory. He's big, he's tall, and he's bold. He played at Cape Town Spurs, Mamlodi Sunnaunt, and has got years playing in Russia. Matthew Booth is in the house. Yeah. And I asked him, straight up, no jokes, where are the white players? Another big guest on Playing the Field with Chicks. Listen to the CV, guys. Cape Town Spurs, Mamlodi Sunnaunt, years and years in Russia, in Europe. Bafana Bafana has got World Cup experience as well. Now as a pundit, you guys know him as Matthew Booth. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks, Rex. Thanks for the invite. No, no, it's always a pleasure, man. I've always wanted to know that you you become a pundit. What's life been like now that you're off the pitch and you're sort of almost uh, critiquing or at least trying to give us the game? Yeah, I, I try try my best to stay away from the from the criticism. Um, yeah. uh, I know how it felt like uh, when uh, analysts uh, criticized my game. Um, yeah. But I think at least I'm in a position where I've played the game before and I kind of tried to understand or make the audience understand what was going through the player's mind, what he or she perhaps could have done a little bit better. Uh, but it's, I always feel a little bit guilty about <laughs> criticism because I, th I don't think fans really appreciate... Um, the the heat of the moment and the decisions that have to be made in that moment yeah. um that that's probably the crux of the matter but um i've i've enjoyed it thoroughly um i work with a, with a great team who's we have we have we have a good laugh on odd occasion 
and we try our best to to educate uh, and make the audience understand perhaps what was going through the player's mind and what was going through the coach's mind. Having said that, I'd love to uh, get my coaching badges. I think um, that sort of education is important for us as well because we always have to um, progress with the game. We can't let the game leave us behind. Uh, so that's that's something that I would love to do as well. That totally makes sense. So I also wanted to ask, when I look at Matthew Booth, it seems like you've had your life in order ever since you stopped playing. And obviously, there's a narrative within South African football where some footballers just do not make it past five years after they've done playing, or even 10 years after done playing. You retired quite a while ago, even though you don't look like it. But I just wanted to know from your side, how what are you getting right that, unfortunately, you have other footballers that are just not getting it right at this moment? Yeah, look, I, th- I think I was always afraid of uh, what I term the afterlife, uh, retirement. Um, some players I just thought uh, lived for today. You know, yeah. um, they didn't think about tomorrow. Um, and so, and I, and I I didn't really have an entourage. Um, what what I what I did uh, regret was not network, networking more while I was still playing. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I always advise um, uh, players now is that uh, once the game is finished, uh, go up to the suite, especially in a big derby game or whatever, big, where there's a big crowd and there's, there's captains of industry watching your game. It's a Pirates, Chiefs games, perhaps, you know. Go up to the suite and interact with, with the captains of industry, with, with, with guys while you're still playing, while you're still relevant. Because I can tell you something now, most of us, uh, once you stop playing, that's it for you. You know, uh, journalists stop calling you, um, you know, your, your fitness goes down, your physical appearance uh, changes. Mm-hmm. And that's why the statistics are, are pretty dire uh, for us. Um, there's, there's large amounts of uh, depression involved as well because of yeah. the changes. And uh, it's, it's multi, the problems are multifaceted. And that's why myself, Brian Beloy and Stanton Fredericks uh, launched the South African Football Legends um, to try and soften the blow and keep the guys um, uh, active and the camaraderie going because that's that's I think one of the most important things that we've missed is the camaraderie within the changing room. I totally hear that. I just wanted to before I jump onto the football that's happening at this current kind of moment. Did you playing in Europe help by how you deal with life after football? Did that help in some kind of way? I'm asking this question because I'm like, should we be promoting our players to try at least also go overseas or? try at least, I don't know, did that help in some kind of way? Um, the, the, any, any kid, uh, young player, um, any, any player in their 20s who gets an opportunity to go and play in Belgium, Holland, Turkey, Russia, Greece, I would say go. Even though you could stay at Pirates Chiefs or Sundowns and earn uh, 300, 350k a month, you know, um, the reason why I'm saying that is because I still feel that you'll be playing uh, with and against better players, coached by better coaches. Uh, you'll be in more of a passionate football environment, and it would be a great stepping stone to progress into EPL, La Liga, uh, what have you, you know, more established um, leagues. And more importantly, uh, it's, it's character building. Um, so in Russia, for example, I would be injured, perhaps not in the team, lacking in confidence. I would go back to a cold apartment with nobody there mm. to, to, to comfort me. And that in itself is a great, um, character building exercise. I also point for that as well. I play a game called Football Manager that actually sort of gives a real life essence of maybe the benefits of going to go play overseas. But your former club, I just want to touch on your former club at this moment. Um, the last five games that they've played, um, I'm really sad they've only been able to score three goals. Some people are talking fatigue. Some people are talking that they're tired, too many games. When you watch Mamluri Sanouns now, what do you think the problem is? Because it doesn't look as fluent as it was at the start of the season. Yeah, I think that's the reason why uh, Rolani was so desperate to get uh, ahead of the game uh, before Christmas, before AFCON, because he knew what was coming, especially when they um, entered the African Football League. You know, <laughs> that was an additional, you know, what was it, eight games, you know, possibly so, or six games, whatever it was. Um, mm. So that just added to the whole 
um, buildup of, of fixtures. So he knew what was coming post AFCON. Plus, the the core of that Bafana team also played in AFCON. So um, the Sundowns team, sorry, played in that AFCON. So um, he knew that post uh, AFCON he was going to have to start to rotate on in a serious manner. Mm. And so I don't think it's really uh, tiredness. I think it's the case of the serious rotation now involved. Um, you can see two or three distinct teams um, now um, in the starting eleven, yeah. and um, I think we all know all football people know um, consistency is key. And when you make that many changes, you're bound to be a bit uh, static. But having said that, you know, especially in their cup games, you know, they're still looking at seventy percent um, possession. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, sixty-five, seventy percent on average. So. Um, I think also teams are, are are deciding to to play a very low block, yeah. Um, and perhaps that frustration, uh, just the the lack of perhaps a little bit more patience, um, has shown them up, and and that's why they're a little bit uh, they're struggling for for goals. So I mean, you've been a footballer before, Matt, and Rani coach Rani always speaks about he does not like to rotate. But then as a fan on the outside, people would say, yeah, but you've got 35 plus players, 35 plus key players. Maybe from a footballing aspect from your side is that why is it so important to sort of not rotate as much and maybe should have Rulani rotated a lot more early on in the season so that he doesn't get inconsistent performances? I don't know how you see it. Well, it's very similar to any workplace, um, Shakes. I mean, if you had um, people in your work team um changing uh every you know what are they playing now three games a week yeah if you had a, a new work colleague uh, alongside <laughs> you who who changes faces uh every uh every week it would be disconcerting yeah. it wouldn't be good for the for the for the team um uh you would have to get to know that person uh, once again um get to know what their what the attributes are and very similar to playing alongside um, uh, your teammates, although you, you, you train together on a daily basis, there are certain systems in play, which, um, for example, uh, Grant Kikana would get used to, um, Mvala playing alongside him. Mm. And he would love to have that, uh, combination for as long as possible. No, that, that's fair. And what's happened recently, we saw a fairy tale story that has happened by Leverkusen being crowned. Bundesliga champions in a league where Bayern was winning the last 11 league titles. Now, the question from South Africa, or I guess for fans here, is like, okay, we see Sanon being strong. They're winning it. But how come Chiefs and Pirates can't do what Leverkusen is doing? Like, why can't they compete in the way by Leverkusen has done? That's a really loaded question. <laughs> how long do you have? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's... I, for the for the past couple of seasons, I've been saying that um, Pirates, Chiefs, Super Sport, even Cape Town City, you know, they they can compete with Sundowns, not on not not financially, yeah. not at the moment. There's no ways that they can. But I use the uh, La Liga example where um, historically Sevilla and uh, Villarreal have competed with your Barcelonas and Real Madrids to a certain extent. Uh, they would win a cup. They would, um, you know, win the Europa uh, League, and they would always be just off the shoulder of perhaps Barca and Real Madrid. And that, the 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 reason for that has been that they've put resources and and not just thrown money at at this, but put put proper resources with intent. Yeah, and that's a very strong word in South Africa. With intent and and delegated well. To their scouting and to their youth development and done it properly. Um, and I don't think we've put enough emphasis on those two aspects. Um, I, I think Sundowns and Cape Town City, um, are the only two current clubs who have scouts, mm. uh, full time scouts who are paid for. I think Chiefs, uh, used to. I'm not sure at the moment. They can perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, but. That, that's not really not good enough, you know. I think um, if you're going to keep with your compete with your Sundowns, um, you've you've got to put uh, proper resources into into those two aspects, 
and not just be YouTube um, <laughs> scouters um, or take recommendations from uh, dodgy agents. Uh, you've you've actually got to go there, see it with your eyes. And what Sundowns do very well is that they don't only watch the player on the field; they they go into m- minute detail into the player's personality, background, family, upbringing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I agree with you with the gas there. I've got two questions remaining left. I'm going to read out a list of names, and then I'll ask the question. Dylan Shepard, Matty Patterson, Gavin Lane, Neil Tovey, Calvin Marlin, Matthew Booth. The list goes on. I'm asking myself, I look at this current that's happening right now in the PSL. Matthew Booth, where are the white players? Yeah, I, it's, it's a question that I get often. Um, and I think Pizzo, again, uh, a couple of years ago, also brought up that fact um, or the question. Uh, was asking the question, and so I've I've been quite fortunate enough to to have two young boys uh, who have played the game, and therefore um, I've I've travelled a lot to amateur football and watched a lot of amateur football, and therefore I've spoken to a lot of parents about football, about South African football. Yeah, um, I've also uh, done quite a bit of charity work and, and community based work, so I'm in a position to speak, not from an authoritative point of view, but from quite a good stance um yeah. and for, for me for me it's more of a class issue shakes um it's not a color issue mm. we we're losing kids um of all colors to the game who who are middle class and upper class mm. um but just visually it seems like <laughs> there's very few uh white kids uh, playing yeah. but so if you go down to any amateur club in Johannesburg for example it's a rainbow of color, white, black, colored, Indian, you name it, you yeah. know, from five years old up to about 14, 15. And then you see a definite change. And, and, um, but it's not a color issue. It's, it's, it's middle class and upper class kids who perhaps are fine, is fine. They're finding training a little bit too difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, or they have to go into areas where they feel unsafe. Mm. or the referee doesn't turn up or mm. the league is badly organized or and then they'll say the upper the, the middle class and upper class kids will say okay no no mom dad uh, I'm going to go and and focus on my studies or I'm going to sit at home and play uh, Xbox mm. or you know this there's, there's many more distractions for them mm. whereas a kid uh, who comes from your lower LSMs will be more hungry he will st- he or she will stick it out because that's that's one of the few things that they can um, uh, aim for and and can feel and want you know and and so that's a constant messaging that I have to teach my boys as well who have who have been who have grown up in a in a golf estate I think I have to constantly remind them that the kids that they're playing with are more hungry for it are you are you hungry enough how much do you want it you know, so I'm in that dilemma. Um, but uh, it, it's to answer your question, it's a, it's, I think it's a class issue. And we as a football uh, nation, our mother body suffer are, are failing in keeping middle class and upper class kids interested in the game. Mm. And that, that's, we, we have to, uh, uh, football is very accessible. That's why it's, the number one sport in the world, but we have to make we have to keep we have to keep it accessible for for everybody as many people as possible. So we can't afford to bring religion into a, a club or anything. We don't want to alienate kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have mm. to keep it secular, and we have to keep um, kids from different backgrounds, from different LSMs involved in the game. That's that's very important. Please, man, that you explain it brilliantly. I have to admit, I I understand. Why now a lot more? And you lead me on to my last question in the way that you've answered that. If I was to ask you, where is South African football for you right now? What would Matthew Boot say? Um, I, I, I'm in a position of hope. Yeah. Um, and I think um, when you look at um, our national women's team, the fact that... Um, They've, they've survived and had such huge success. Um, simply 
if you look at the lack of resources that they've been given over the last decade, yeah. you've got to appreciate that fact, you know. Um, they've done fantastically well, very resilient, um, and they deserve a, a, a proper professional league. Um, and a young girl, girl child must be getting the, op- the same opportunities as a, as a young boy child, you know, across whether it's urban, rural, government, private school, that's got to be the case. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. Once that happens, um, the, the, our pool, our talent, our pool talent will increase dramatically, you know? Yeah. Um, so we've got to get that right. Um, but the, the hope comes from uh, our recent performance in, in, in AFCON, uh, bronze, bronze medal. Yeah. Um, that I can now, I can now proudly say that I'm an ex national team player. Whereas before, uh, I would, I would hate it when one of my mates said, Hey, brew, hey, so when is, uh, Bafana going to win the World Cup, eh, bro? <laughs> you know, like I was just, uh, like, do me a favor, just kill me now. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> Um, so now you can at least, you know, walk around uh, proudly saying that you, you're an ex player, you're part of the football industry and long may that last. But it's also a bit of a false, it's a bit of a facade, you know, it's a mm. bit, a bit it almost seems like it was a sundowns project to me. And that, that, that's got to change, you know, um, mm. we can't have, we can't have one institution dominating our game just like, we can't have um, young, talented kids all moving to Johannesburg. Uh, so we've got to decentralize our our game and mm. uh, provide uh, centers of excellence all around our country. And we'll it can be done. And let's let's hope it will be. Yeah. No. We 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 live in hope. Uh, Matt, you just want to say thank you for being a guest on my show. You dropped a lot of gems. I'm really appreciative of that. And I uh, hope that we do this again. I enjoy your analysis. I enjoy what you're doing for the game. And the objective thinking with what you said about what's happening at the grassroots levels of football is, is unreal. No, thank you very much for the kind words, man. Always a pleasure. I look forward to it. Awesome, man. Keep well and please take care, yeah? Cheers. You too, Chuck. Keep on, man. Cheers, man. Who was up to par and who became our star? But also, who fell short in this game we all love? Let's find out on Muhu of the Week. The stars of this week, it's the most obvious one. Stellenbosch, this show is for you guys. I spoke about you guys and I'm going to carry on speaking because you guys are the stars. And any team that puts four goals past Gavin Hunt's Super Sport United team deserves to be the stars of this week. As for the Muhu, Masikole Babiso. That's the referee that officiated the game between Amazulu and Orlando Pirates. Man, you wanted to make it a bad game. You nearly ruined such a good game with your shameful decisions. Luckily, Orlando Pirates and Amazulu saved it. But you are definitely the Muhu of the week. It's time for Bet of the Week. Get ready to win big by placing the right bets on the right games. A very short bet slip, but with some high odds. Four games only, the Champions League games only. We're going premium. We don't want no Europa League conference. No, no, no. We're going just Champions League only. Dortmund going up against Atletico Madrid. Both teams will score. Yes. Barcelona going up against PSG, Barca or draw and over 1.5. Bayern going up against Arsenal. Overall winner to go through to the semi. I've gone with Arsenal. Yeah, I think Arsenal is going to stun people in Germany. Manchester City at home against Real Madrid over 2.5 goals. The odds you ask me for four games, 8.09. Just for four games, eight times your money back. I mean, come on. If you want to win with me, click on the link below. Remember to practice responsible betting at betway.co.za. We've come to the end of the show. So every time at the end of the show, I always think about what am I going to sign it off with? And I just simply thought a shout out to you guys. Yep, you guys who have stayed and even those that are new. But if you are new, Hit the like button, subscribe to the show, and hit the notification bell so you're notified for future episodes. I love y'all.